Um, next week I have a challenge of putting two, two lessons into one. So I think I can do it. If not, we will be, you will be like in Troas, we will, Paul, when Paul preached to midnight, we may do that. So um, bring whatever you need for that. Now, I think we'll get it done fine, but it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Um, in 1989, I had settled down to uh, watch the World Series first game of the World Series was in San Francisco. And we had eaten dinner, and I was about ready to sit down and watch the, the first game of the World Series, when suddenly, on the television, there was, the, the picture started shaking. What was happening was, they, in, on live TV, were experiencing a 4.9 earthquake. And it was shaking to the point that the Bay Bridge and many of the roads in San Francisco were destroyed. It was an interesting thing because the World Series did not go on that night, needless to say. And it was something everybody would remember. And everybody sees the result. This is the problem. We see the result of things without thinking about how it got there. How it got there was very simple. It was not one thing. It was a process over time. This is what's called the San Andreas Fault. That's what caused the earthquake. And what that means is there are two pieces of, of, of earth separated just hair, by hair length, and they begin to move in opposite directions. And as they move in opposite directions, that puts pressure on everything. And the more pressure that builds one day, it has to relieve the pressure, and that's why you have the earthquake. It's the process that creates the problem. That was true about the restoration movement as well. Um, three things were going to cause the same problem. The things that you needed to have set were always going to cause the same issues. The first was about the Bible. We've talked about the Bible, how important it was. But the problem is not everybody began to see the Bible the same way. And the question got to be, what is inspired anymore? That's a big issue. The second was, how do you do church? How do you put the church together? And suddenly you found people wanting to use instruments in worship. Uh, they began to change modes and reasons for baptisms. They changed organizational patterns. And you had to decide what that was going to be. And it wasn't coming together. And finally, it was this constant idea. You're going to restore over unity or you're going to re unity over restoration. And the idea that we started with. The very basic premise of everything that was done is that the way you achieve unity is to restore the pattern in the New Testament. If you did what they did, you will be the same church they were. They were only one church without division. Now, if you do the same thing, that would happen again. That looks like that's an easy premise. The things that are easy to say, in theory, are hardly easy to work out in practice. And that was always this problem. And this would become the issue, is that still valid? We're going to talk about that more next week as well. And there was this tension of togetherness. Um, in the very beginning, you had two groups. You had the Stones and you had the Campbells, and they came together. And while they shared a lot of ideas, they had some things that weren't exactly the same. And they worked those out in 1830, but over time, those things began to show up again. That was part of the problem. <clears throat> and anytime you put things together, you have tension. It's true about marriages, isn't it? You, you put, get people to get married, everybody has Disney in their mind. We're going to live happily ever after until somebody doesn't take out the trash. Until they leave the cap off of the toothpaste tube. Until they leave their, <clears throat> their clothing places not clothing supposed to go. And this whole idea about how life should happen 
suddenly it bumps into two people who are trying to make it happen, and they have different ideas. It happens with college roommates. Um, my daughter, when she was a junior in high school, went to junior scholars at Abilene Christian University. You could take three hours of college credit and, and during the summer. So she spent a, a, a year, a semester there, which is six weeks. The interesting thing was she had never done that before. <clears throat> She had never experienced life before. She was not the, the cleanest person at home. I began to have doubts how she would do at college. I didn't have to worry. When she got to college, she had a roommate from Georgia who, to say she was filthy is to put a good face on filthy. My daughter would call home every day and said, you would not believe what it's like here. I have never lived like this before. And I just smiled, I thought. And you thought we were being cruel all these years when we told you to pick stuff up, didn't you? When she came home after that six weeks, she became a neat freak deluxe because she saw that if you live with somebody else, they're not exactly who you are either. That was the same problem with the restoration movement. You suddenly had two different ideas coming together and creating tension. Uh, and eventually, it began to boil over. You had the problem of organization and, and cooperation. And people began to ask the question, well, what does the New Testament say? And some people would say, it doesn't say, so you can do as you please. Suddenly, you also got to the sectionalism that was created by the Civil War where we couldn't talk to each other anymore. And if you can't talk to each other anymore, you can't walk, work out differences. There were places that you were not welcome and that you would not welcome them. And there was this growing tension among various parts of the country and the church. And then there was this idea of the instrument coming in. And suddenly, you could not worship the way you always had because somebody else said, we are going to use an instrument. You said, I object. And they said, then that's too bad. We took a vote. We think it's okay. And then they began studying things like German liberalism, and suddenly the whole fabric of Scripture comes undone. And soon, the lid's going to blow off. And they had to go separate ways. And the Restoration Movement, who up until about 1900, had an, an uneasy unity, ceased being unified. And now you have two different ways the movement goes. And that's where we are today. In fact, it's worse today. Now, there were two major figures that were on the left-hand side, the ones who were, who were pushing progressivism. One was J.H. Garrison. Now, you probably don't know anything about J.H. Garrison, do you? The other was B.W. Johnson. You ever heard of B.W. Johnson? If you're old enough, you know about B.W. Johnson. If you don't know about B.W. Johnson, bless your heart. Um, I remember B.W. Johnson wrote this. This, is, this was published in 1891, by the way. It's called Johnson's Notes. I remember my dad, when we went to, when we would go to church, when we go to Bible class, he carried two things with him. He carried a Bible, and he carried Johnson's Notes. And here's how Bible classes went when I was a boy, in adult classes. They would say, what does it say in verse 14? And somebody would read verse 14. And then they would ask, what does it mean? And the next thing out of their mouth is, Johnson says, if Johnson said it, it had to be true. If we only knew enough about Johnson, we wouldn't have been quoting Johnson for all those years. Because Johnson was, and, and Garrison started a, a paper called the Christian Evangelist. And the Christian Evangelist had two major driving points to it. One, that it was a uh, strong supporter of the Missionary Society. Missionary Society had gone through all kinds of problems, and most people had kind of forgotten about it. They kept pushing. The second one, they promoted the use of it, the instrument worship. And... Johnson, even though we used his notes, 
he wasn't always what we think he is. He was a big promoter of instrumental music in the church. And so we had Johnson as a residue, but we didn't use everything he said. But in that paper, The Christian Evangelist, J.H. Garrison wrote an article on Christian unity. Now listen to the article as he puts it. Christian union comes, when it comes, will not be uniformity. Now let's define that. He says, there will be room in it for differences of opinion, different methods of work and worship, different forms of organization, and different degrees of emphasis. If you want to cut through all the, the archaic language, it means you can kind of do as you please, as long as we're brethren. Do you hear the emphasis? It's no longer restoration that creates unity. It's ignoring restoration to create unity. That was what was taking place. Um, then, everything began to change again. In 1878, Benjamin Franklin, who had been the leading voice of conservatives in the North, as uh, the editor of the American Christian Review, he died. And that unleashed a floodgate in the North. Now the restraining influence in the North was gone. And what was left was those who were progressive in their thinking that restoration is an old idea that doesn't need to be done. They now have free sway to do what they want to do. And they did it. In the South, they remained conservative. Primarily because David Lipscomb was the editor of the Gospel Advocate. And the Advocate had a strong influence in Southern churches. And because of that, Southern churches tended to be conservative. Now, they had something interesting in the, the Advocate. The Advocate had various people, usually around the South. They didn't have many readers up north. But around the South, they'd have these various people in churches, and they would report from various areas. One of those was the state of Texas. And the Texas reporter who would write reports back on how the church is doing in Texas was a guy named Austin McGarry. You probably have never heard of Austin McGarry. You may know a little bit about what he, pre he produced, though. He and, and, and Lipscomb saw everything just the same except for the idea of rebaptism. Now, do you realize there are two ways to look at rebaptism? Somebody comes forward on Sunday, for instance, and you say, Have you been baptized in the Christ? It says, Yes, when I was 10 years old, I was baptized in a Baptist church. What do you do now? That's the problem. And what Lipscomb believed was if they honestly believed in their heart that they were baptized for the right reasons in the right way, we can't question that. That was Lipscomb's response. McGarry, though, believed that it didn't make any difference what they thought. We're going to put them under again, just to make sure. Now, both of those are still available. I, I don't know if I've told the story or not, but I remember I got caught in a line with the uh, who was the guy that made the film strips? My mind just went blank. Jewel, Jewel Miller. Jewel Miller. I, I knew Jewel Miller. I, was a, I ghost wrote for him twice, because, but he was hard to ghost write for, so I quit doing that. Um, but I was in line with Jewel Miller at the Preacher's Elders Deacon's Dinner at Abilene Christian University Lectureship. Now, I've got to tell you, there's something about giving preachers, elders, and deacons free meals that brings them out. It's like roaches in the dark. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. You didn't know there were that many preachers in, in the country, but they all showed up for free lunches. But I remember I was standing in line with, he started telling me this story. The story was this. He said, there's this couple that came in my office, and they wanted to get married, but I wanted to find out if they, had, they were Christians. And so I asked 
her and she said, yes, I've been baptized, but I was baptized by a Baptist preacher, but I was baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I can tell you what Jewel did. I don't think I would have done this. But Jewel said, who was it that, that baptized you? She gave the name of a preacher in Houston, because that's where they were. And he picked up the phone book and looked up his number, and he called him. And he said, let me ask you a question. You baptized this girl and such and such. Do you remember that? He's, and I can almost hear him say on the other phone, are you kidding me? I've forgotten what I learned yesterday. But that's not, I don't think that's what he said. He said, yes, I did. And so Jewel then asked him this question. Why did you baptize her? For what reason? And he said to get into the Baptist church. She was already saved. Jewel hung up the phone and said, you got to be rebaptized." <laughs> I thought to myself, as Jewel's telling that story, I thought, so what you're really saying is, is what's in the mind of the person doing the baptizing that makes the difference, not the, person, the idea in the person's the heart. That's the problem here. We, we kind of passed that off, but I guarantee you, unless you have come down this pike enough times, you don't know what the issue is. Do you baptize them or don't d baptize them? How much do you go through? I got to tell you, when I talk to people and they've said they've been baptized, I don't let them tell me that, they're, that they've been baptized for forgiveness of sins. I start at the beginning and say, let's draw this out. You tell me what, what was going on. When were you saved? When were you baptized? What do you think the baptism, I mean, they probably get sick of me in that lesson. But I'm trying to avoid the McGarvey Lipscomb problem. And uh, it happens that way. But they were still staunch supporters of the same idea. McGarry founded a little publication called the Firm Foundation. Anybody remember the Firm Foundation? You've got to be old enough. I wrote some articles for the Firm Foundation um, when Rule Lemons was the editor. The problem was Rule died. And when he died, some of our brethren, who had not so noble of motives, took it over and killed it. And I wish it was there today because the Firm Foundation was one of the few publications that had a, a moderating voice to it uh, when it was here. It was basically a Texas paper. Some people read outside of Texas, but in Texas, everybody read it in the 60s and 70s. But why did all this take place? Why was the division happening? What was creating this, this problem? There is never a single idea but they had this different antagonistic interpretation of the principle. See, Campbell has enunciated that there was a pattern in the New Testament and you followed the pattern. Suddenly, people begin to say, I don't think there's much of a pattern and I don't think what you're seeing as a pattern is a pattern. Now, let me warn you about this is a preview of next week. We're still saying that today in some, some parts of the church. The second thing was the Civil War had come and created all this, this difficulty and it made civil relations impossible. And then finally there was this growing social and economic difference that was taking place of urban and rural. In the, at the beginning of the 19th century, 20th century, most of America was rural. By the time we got to the 21st century, most of America was urban. When you change from rural to urban, it changes how you think. We don't believe that, but it does. And not only that, you became a middle class. The North had many more jobs that were urbanized and industrial than the South, and they began to make money that other people didn't make. They were able to be upwardly mobile. When you become upwardly mobile, you want to look like the other people who are upwardly mobile. If you weren't, you didn't care what you had. In the South, what you had was little buildings that were white wood on the other side of the tracks with the paint peeling off of them. You never find that in a decent northern church. They'd be brick with an organ. And so you had this, this division of all these things happening. And then it came 1906. 1906, there was a time where the Census Bureau had, they had part of the census that decided, that wanted to find out how many people were in all these different churches. 
I don't think they do that anymore. Partly because it may be embarrassing to some people to say that. But in 1906, they were doing it. So the 1906 census, they were going to come out with a report on religious bodies in the country at that time. And there was a letter from the head of director, the director of the, the Census Bureau, uh, named S.N.D. North, and he sent a letter to the Gospel Advocate Office. After all, if you have a group of people who don't, do not have a central location, a central organization, you have to find somebody who'll speak to you, and everybody pointed at Lipscomb. He'd know. And his question is simple. Is there a religious body called Church of Christ, not identified with the disciples of Christ or any other Baptist body? That's the question. It was in the letter in 1907. And Lipscomb answered them this way. I like, I like his answer because it's, it's pretty impressive. Because he says, the polity of churches being purely congregational influences the work slowly and division comes gradually. The parties are distinguished as they call themselves conservatives and, or, and progressives as they call each other antis. Does that sound like today? Those folks are liberal over there. Well, those folks, they're conservative. Well, they're just against everything. And we're still there. In many places, the differences have not yet resulted in separation. And what he goes on to say is there are a lot of conservative churches, especially in the north, who they were still prevalent. And those who wanted to use the instrument and other things, if they wanted to go to church, they had to go to church there. There was no other game in town. And so there was this this uh, uneasy feeling about being in the same place. But he said the reverse is also true. Many of the conservatives are trying to appropriate the name Church of Christ, Churches of Christ, to distinguish themselves from Christian or Disciples of Christ churches. Why do we have Church of Christ on the, the sign out there? There it is. You can, you can quote Romans 16, 16 all you want to, but I guarantee you this is where it happened, in America at least. And the problem is that when he answered that, he was only acknowledging what had happened. There are people who blamed Lipscomb for splitting the church. He said that and he just split the church in half. He couldn't have split the church because the church was already split. He was just acknowledging what was happening. And he was slow in doing it. He had been tolerating the instrumental music question for the last 35, 40 years. And he was just now recognizing it. Now, there's something interesting about this. Uh, one of my professors in college was Dr. Furman Curley. Furman left teaching and he became the editor of the Gospel Advocate. I remember back in the 90s, if you remember back about 30 years ago, one of the things that started happening in the church was there's this rise of, of the call for the use of the instrument to be more inclusive, to be more, uh, if people want to, they could, but if they don't want to, they don't have to. That was kind of the thinking. Now, that created a lot of tension. I remember I went to a meeting in Abilene during lectureship one time in which there were supposed to have been 20 people invited. 300 showed up. And most of the 300 that were there were not happy. They had brought their pitchforks and their axes. They are pretty to cut that church in half one way or another. And they said, we need to divide ourselves from all those brethren out there who are doing that. I'll never forget, though, Furman got up on the podium. And when some of his magnitude would step up the podium, people would listen. He said, when I became the editor of The Advocate... I decided I was going to read everything that David Lipscomb wrote. He said, I have learned in this process that there were calls back in the 1870s for division. And for 30 years, Lipscomb would not do that. He was hoping against hope, but he was wanting it to stay together. He said, I've decided that for all the calls some of you gentlemen are making for division, I'm going to defer to Brother Lipscomb. 
And that kind of calmed that crowd down, sort of. A man can't create the division that events have already caused. That's part of this. And so today, this is what you find. You find the Christian church is larger. I use the word Christian church, as you're going to find out why in a moment. They're more focused in the north, while the churches of Christ are smaller and located in the ten southern states. Why do we have missionaries in Vermont and Pennsylvania when in Pennsylvania, when in, uh, when in Pennsylvania that was the home of Alexander Campbell? And why in Vermont? Because that's the home of, of uh, Jones and Smith, who were early restorers. The reason is, it's because we left the north because we couldn't tolerate some things. So we're in the south. And today, we're trying to get the church back together in a place where it used to be strong. Interesting turn of events. So what happens after 1906 to that other part of the movement? We'll talk about us next week. Uh, there's enough in us to create another lesson. But what about that other part? See, there are two parts that we're going to talk about. They're going to end up being three. One is the disciples of Christ on the left. The other is churches of Christ on the right. Those are the two big pieces for now. But the disciples moved even farther left. Without restraining influences, they changed a lot of things. And uh, you, you may remember last week we talked about R.C. Cave and how he moved to St. Louis and he espoused German theological liberalism and, and how the disciples were part of the uh, seminary at the University of Chicago that was dedicated to humanistic thought. And these things begin to move even further. Now the church in, in those areas were denying the miracles of Christ. They den denied the virgin birth of Christ. And they den denied the inspiration of Scripture. Today you'll find those churches still do that and maybe worse. We're going to talk about that. But in 1908 in Philadelphia, in the interest of promoting unity... 32 denominations created what was called the Federal Council of Churches. It became later the National Council of Churches. Years ago, the National Council would always put on these, these funny ads trying to promote morality, even though most of them cut their losses from that. That included the Disciples of Christ. It was to promote an ecumenical view. In other words, I'm okay, you're okay. We don't have any differences. We just all can be brethren together, nice, happy. We'll sing kumbaya around the campfire, hug each other and say, isn't it great to be a Christian? How did you get to be one? I'm not one. Well, that's okay. That's ecumenical. I know I overdrew that. That's okay. I've been accused of that before. And so in 1926, though, something was about to happen again. They rocked along for about 20 years that way until... Some of the missionaries in the ecumenical spirit on the mission field began to teach that baptism was not essential for the forgiveness of sins. And they quit baptizing people. You see, that's the ultimate logical step. You can't sit down and say, well, we'll still hold on to that. This is going to go too. That meant the conservatives that were left in the disciples left. They had had enough. They'd been tolerant for 20 years. They weren't going to be tolerant anymore. And they became what is called the conservative Christian church. The conservative Christian church, I have a lot, I have a lot of friends, and had a lot of friends in the conservative Christian church. In my previous church, there was a, a conservative Christian church across town. And uh, I'd have lunch with the preacher there. We had a great time. We pretty much shared everything except for one thing, as I'm going to show I had my, my girls went to school with people who went to that church, nice people. The only thing was, and they were like us, they didn't fellowship the disciples. If you're going to get off on that limb, you're going to be there by yourself. We're not going to be part of it. We don't fellowship the disciples either. And they, though, still use the instrument. And... It's interesting for them. Now, I, uh, 
I, I'm always interested in how things play out. In that church I was telling you about where I knew the preacher, the preacher ended up being retired. He was about my age, and they decided the way to deal with him is just to give him retirement, tell him to go away. And they, did, and they hired their youth minister to be the preacher who that guy didn't know which end was up. I had to do a funeral with him once. Didn't like it. And the reason they got rid of him was because he favored the piano while the youth minister favored a band. And the problem was they brought the band in and half of the church left because they could take the piano, but they couldn't take the band. Isn't that interesting? And some of them call themselves Church of Christ, especially up north. I remember that. In 1964, my family was going to the New York World's Fair. We were taking one of these road trips. And every day you had to make so many miles if you were going to make it on a certain day. And so uh, we were on a Sunday, got up early, started driving. My dad said, we're going to stop at a church and we'll, we'll worship and then get back on the road. So we go through Indiana. When we get to Indiana, there's this little white building on the, on the highway that says Church of Christ. My dad pulls up there, and we're just a hair late, not much, not more than any other church is. And, uh, but I'll never forget, we're marching up these little stairs, and he pulls open the door, and when he opened the door, you could hear the strains of the piano. My dad shut the door and says, I think we'll quit, keep driving. That was a Christian church that used the name Church of Christ. And therefore... They were just like this. They have something called the North American Christian Convention. They still have it every year. Um, it's more of a big lectureship for Christian churches. And it looks very much like our lectureships. They have speakers. They have classes. They even have a Bible bowl for teenagers. Sounds like LTC, doesn't it? That's what they do. And, it's, and it's, it would look very familiar to us except for when Bertha plays the piano, and that's when we would find our problems. But the disciples, they kept pushing this emphasis on unity. They were jettisoning the idea that restoration was a good idea at all. The unity is the reason they exist. They believed, in fact, that, that Barton W. Stone believed in unity above restoration, and so they were going to be followers of Stone and emphasize unity. And so they and some other gr religious groups be formed what was called the Consultation on Christian Union, COCU is what it has done. And uh, in that area, I want you to look at this list. These are the churches that were part of the, the Consultation of Christian Union. And if you'll notice down there at the very bottom, next to the bottom, it says United Church of Christ. Don't be fooled. There's an old joke that goes like this. The local preacher was invited to the Chamber of Commerce luncheon to speak for them, and so one of the people got up to introduce him. And they said, our speaker for the day is Reverend Joe Smith, who is the pastor at the United Church of Christ in town. Introducer sat down, speaker gets up, he says, I need to clarify some things. I appreciate it, but I do need to clarify some things. First of all, we don't call the preacher reverend, so I'm not a reverend. Secondly, the preacher is not the pastor. That's what the elders are, but I'm not the pastor. And third, we've never been united. <laughs> There's a lot of truth to sarcasm, let me tell you. But see, this is the list, and you think about all the different religious groups in that list, and you say, how in the world did they do anything together? The answer is, they didn't care about what the Bible had to say. It's really easy to work together if you really don't care about anything. And that lasted a few years, and it kind of fell apart, too. And so the disciples today are decidedly liberal. And when I mean decidedly, I mean decidedly. They have decided that they're going to be that way. If you get on websites... If you get on the website, for instance, the Disciples of Christ Church is in the corner of uh, Park and uh, Independence in Plano. You'll hardly hear the mention of the word Bible, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or worship. It's not important. We're an inclusive fellowship. 
And so we have taken away all the things that will create problems for someone to come in and join us. They have redefined church. They are now social. It's the best way I can put it. The church does not exist to be evangelistic or to worship God or to teach the Bible. It's to love people the way they are. You can just imagine which road that goes down. They also do not believe in the inspiration of Scripture. It's a human book that can be, defined, that can be def interpreted like a human book. They don't believe in miracles. That those, those were made up by the disciples of the first century to, to try to push Jesus to the forefront. And for most of them, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus. Jesus was a man, if he existed at all, is the way it will be put. He did not do miracles. He didn't even think he was the Son of God, didn't want to be the Son of God. After he died, the church had to make something up to make that happen. That's what the disciples think. And so that's one of the things that's happening. They view restoration as no longer tenable. In fact, really they call it embarrassing. If I were to teach this class in a disciples group tonight, I would be run out of town on a rail because I'm an embarrassing, backward fool. That's how they would say it. And they consider us a sect. Not the church, a sect. We're a break-off sect to the restoration movement of which they are still the faithful ones and we have created the problem. But one good thing, they have preserved our heritage. Most of the things I told you tonight are here because, or, or through the whole less series of lessons, because the disciples of Christ have preserved a lot of documents. They have a historical society that has preserved restoration history. And so we could not even do this had they not done that. One of the few good things they've done. But as we come to the end, we're getting close. I'm glad I didn't put two lessons in for the day. Uh, but there are some things that you can observe from all of this process of this movement from one church to two churches to three churches and next week even to more. Uh, when you change, you never change a little. You always change a lot. The biggest problem when people start talking about change in the church is they think, oh, we'll just make a little tweak here. Little tweaks are never little tweaks. They're the beginning of something that you can't see where it's about to lead. We addressed the idea of the, of the slippery slope last week, but the truth is change in the church has always created a slope, always. So when you change something, be very, very careful because that's not the only change that's going to happen. That's what our history tells us. But the second is once you have gone too far, you can't go back. You realize there is no church that has gone liberal that has decided in their heart of hearts, we need to stop doing this and go back to the way we were. Not one of them. You look around our area. One of the big things going on right now in Churches of Christ in the Dallas area are two things. One, there's a movement toward the left, the use of women in worship, the use of instruments in worship, uh, women elders and preachers, and various other phenomena. The other is, they have gotten so small they've closed. Once they made the movement, they couldn't go back. Which means you've got to be very careful about what you do in the church because every change will take you somewhere and there's no backpedaling from it. That's a real problem, as we're going to see next week. And the truth be told, out of all the division that has come, there has to be a line in the sand. There's a line somewhere. And you have to determine where you stand based upon the New Testament. If you're going to accept the New Testament and the pattern of the New Testament, it provides restrictions. It will not be popular. There will be people who say, I want something different. But we stand 
for the pattern of the New Testament. But there are those who they say, there is no pattern, there is no scripture. There is only us, and we will do as we please. And therefore, we are where we are today. And next week, we're going to look in the mirror one last time at ourselves where we have been for the last hundred years. And that's not a pretty picture either. And if I can fit all these together, what's the future look like? And those things will close up our lesson then, and uh, it can be yours. So I appreciate you being with me tonight. And I hope you've gotten something out of it. We'll continue uh, next week and try to finish everything out. So thank you very much.